Great to be here with everyone. Um, it, and, and a really important conversation today, I think, um, because uh, I don't know about you, Whitney, but there have been nights in the last couple of weeks where I just haven't slept that well, right? There's just there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of worry, there's a lot of uncertainty and, and so forth. And uh, has that been true for you? As, absolutely. I feel like my sleep has been uh, a little less than ideal <laughs> lately, for sure. Probably for a lot of you out there, too, I'd imagine. Yeah, no, in, in, indeed so. So um, we're, we're very lucky to have with us uh, today like the perfect speaker for this. Um, he's um, professor of neuroscience and psychology at Berkeley uh, in California and director of the Center for Human Sleep Science. Author of a book uh, three years ago, um, Why We Sleep, and last year gave a TED Talk that's been seen nearly 10 million times now. So it's a, it's a treat to invite here Matt Walker. Thanks, Whitney. You'll be back, right? Whitney will be back with questions from, from you all in a bit. Hi there, Matt. How are you? I'm good, Chris. And how are you doing? And thank you so much for having me on. Well, uh, thank you. It's very good to have you here. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess that's the, going to be the first question on top of people's minds is, you know, is there a case that sleep matters now more than ever? Um, I think, firstly, it's important for me to, to not necessarily feed into people's anxiety regarding sleep. I know, as you mentioned, the sleep is difficult for some people when anxiety is high. And of course, that's never more so um, at present. So what I would say is that if anything that we're talking about feels as though it's a trigger, feel free just to come back at a time that feels better in terms of that anxiety level. Um, in terms of sleep and COVID-19, right now we don't necessarily have any evidence to suggest that there is some kind of a link between those two. But certainly what we know is that um, there is a very intimate relationship between your sleep health and your immune health. And I'll give you just a couple of examples. Um, there was a study some years ago that demonstrated that individuals who reported getting um, less than seven hours of sleep um, had almost a threefold increased likelihood of becoming infected by the rhinovirus, which is what we all think of as the common cold, relative to those who were getting eight hours of sleep or more. Um, there was another study in over 50,000 women, and what they found was that individuals who were getting five hours of sleep or less had a 70% increased uh, risk for developing pneumonia, which is a respiratory lung infection relative to those who are getting eight hours of sleep or more. Um, but I think perhaps one of the most striking results in this relationship between sleep and immune health um, was a study where they demonstrated if you're not getting sufficient sleep in the week before you get your flu shot, you produce less than 50% of the normal antibody response, therefore rendering that vaccination um, significantly less effective. So I think um, particularly actually on that last point, at some point, we will develop a vaccine for COVID-19. And then the question becomes, is the same thing true? If you're not getting the sleep that you need in the week before you get your COVID shot, will that um, immunization become significantly less effective? I actually think that's an important question that we will need to answer in the future. OK, so no specific uh, evidence. How could there be? This is a fairly uh, this is a new threat to humanity. But given that, in a, in a way, the you know if, if someone gets infected, there follows this sort of epic battle between a virus and their immune system. It's it's obvious common sense to give your immune system every shot it can, every chance it can. And uh, in many other cases, sleep is known to do that. So I mean, it really ma it matters now. It's up there. I think it. I think certainly uh, from immune health perspective, we know that sleep essentially sharpens. Um, every tool in that box, sleep essentially restocks the weaponry in your immune arsenal, um, giving you the greatest chance to fight off infection. And I think as of at least uh, April 2020, um, we don't have that evidence yet. I know that there are a number of studies, however, that are looking at that. Even some of the um, sleep tracking companies are trying to um, rally efforts around that and examine this right now. So we will have the data, I'm sure. Well, a little later in this interview, we're going to dig into how to sleep better. I know you've got uh, a lot of interesting advice in that regard. 
Uh, but before we go there, let, let's let's spend a bit more time thinking about the different ways that sleep can be really helpful now. Because paradoxically, I and mean, we actually many of us have, in theory, at any rate, more time to sleep mm -hmm. than we've ever had. And so, um, boy, if we could put that to use, how else how else could it help us just during our waking day and the things that we're having to focus on now? Sleep is, seems to provide a benefit to almost every major organ system in the body and many of the operations of the mind. And perhaps I'll just give two examples within the mind. Uh, one of the things that we know sleep is essentially um, uh, incredibly beneficial for is learning memory and even creativity. And when it comes to memory, sleep is important in perhaps at least three ways. Firstly, we know that you need sleep before learning to actually prepare your brain um, a little bit like um, a dry sponge, ready to initially absorb new memories and lay down those new memory traces. But that's not enough. You not only need sleep before learning to imprint those memories into the brain, you also need sleep after learning to essentially cement those new memories into the neural architecture of the brain so that you don't forget. Um, and certainly there's very good evidence for that. In fact, sleep almost performs a file transfer mechanism where it takes memories and shifts them from a sort of a short-term vulnerable reservoir to a more permanent long-term storage site within the brain. And that's what we used to think that sleep was beneficial for, um, taking individual memories and holding onto them, as it were, future-proofing that information. But we've since discovered that sleep is actually much more intelligent than that. Sleep will actually take new memories and start to integrate and associate them with pre-existing stores of information. Um, so it's almost uh, a little bit like memory alchemy at night so that you wake up the next day with a revised mind-wide web of associations. And that leads to remarkable states of um, creativity. And there's lots of good examples for this studies in the laboratory showing that um, sleep can inspire almost a threefold increase um, in creative insights. Uh, and it's probably the reason that you know, you've, you've never been told to stay awake on a problem, um, but instead you're, you're told to sleep on a problem. And I think that phrase mm -hmm. seems to exist in almost every language that I've inquired about um, to date, which means that this creative benefit of sleep transcends cultural boundaries it's common across the globe. That is one of the most mind-boggling things to me about how you can be worried about something or puzzled about something. And you wake up in the middle of the night and suddenly, you know, possibilities pop into place. The answer is there. And um, the, the fact that you're, in one way, it's kind of annoying because it means your unconscious mind has been there somehow, you know, with the benefit <laughs> of sleep, I guess, pre-associating and doing things that you were supposed to do all by yourself. And it's not fair. But in other ways, it's it's it's... It's super cool. And, and so you're saying that there's like how, how the three times the creative output. I, I'm very curious as to how that's measured. But I mean, that, 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 that's that's an amazing claim if you if you have enough if you have enough sleep. Yeah. So there's a, a lovely study done by some German researchers a couple of years ago. And the way that they did this, they gave people um, a series of problems that had a hidden embedded rule into it. And they never told them about that rule. But through exposure, perhaps gradually you can divine that hidden insight that is sort of locked into that problem. And then they bring them back and then they test them at some point later to see if the light bulb moment has gone on for those individuals and they've divined that sort of creative solution, that hidden rule. And you can do that um, after being awake or you can do that after being asleep. And that's how they can start to tease apart um, is it just time that the brain needs for creativity? Is it time awake or instead is it time asleep? And it was time asleep that seemed to gift the brain this sort of creative genius ability. Um, and I, I think something else you mentioned there that's interesting too, it's not just creativity, but sleep can also, I think, change our emotional and mood state, sort of feeling better the next day. And that's what we're now starting to learn is is another function of sleep for the mind, that sleep um, provides almost a form of overnight therapy, that sleep will take those difficult, stressful um, situations or problems, and sleep almost acts like um, a nocturnal soothing balm 
just sort of taking the sharp edges off our emotional experiences so that we come back the next day and we don't feel as challenged or as triggered by those events anymore. Um, so it's not necessarily, I think, time um, that heals all wounds. It's time with a night of sleep that provides that form of emotional convalescence. Uh, and that's perhaps particularly important in this modern era. Um, I think there's a lovely quote by uh, the American entrepreneur, Joseph E. Kosman, and he said, the best bridge between despair and hope is a good night of sleep. Um, and I think that's particularly prescient right now. I mean, you can certainly imagine that a lot of people right now are wrestling with various mental health <clears throat> issues that are possibly exacerbated by the state that we're in. And uh, I, I guess what I'm hearing you saying is don't forget the simplest therapy of all, which is, is, is to sleep enough that, that that in itself may help. Yeah, sleep, I think we're learning, performs um, a form of emotional first aid, as it were. Um, and it reminds me actually of another lovely phrase by um, Charlotte Bronte, who said that a ruffled mind makes for a restless pillow. And I think we've all had that experience of feeling sort of triggered that um, that day, and we just know that sleep isn't necessarily going to come at night. It's probably yeah. also the reason. Um, uh, sorry, yes, go on. No, now you go on. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. I think it's it's part of the the reason that we're finding that sleep is so tied into psychiatric um, disorders and mental health conditions. Um, in the past twenty years, for example, we've not been able to discover a single psychiatric condition in which sleep is normal. Um, so I think sleep has a very powerful story to tell in our understanding and probably treatment of um, serious mental illness. I mean, there's another issue that I suspect a lot of people are wrestling with right now is that a lot of people's response to um, being isolated and feeling a bit stressed is to imagine more and more delicious things to eat and cook. <laughs> people, you know, we, 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 mm -hmm. we go to comfort mm -hmm. food. Um, is, is, and so people, some people, are, you know, what if they're, may wrestle with weight issues even more now than normal. I think you've argued that sleep has a role to play in in the battle against gaining weight. It does. Um, and, you know, I, I think very understandably right now that that may also be relevant. We know how this mechanism plays out where if we're not sleeping well, um, we can start to gain weight. The first piece of evidence concerns hormones and two specific hormones that control our hunger levels. Those two hormones are called leptin and ghrelin. Um, and I often say that they, they almost sound like hobbits, but I promise you they're not. They're actually uh, sort of real um, hormones. Now, leptin, when it's released, is the signal to your brain to say you're full, you're satiated, you don't want to eat anymore. Whereas ghrelin does the opposite, it says, you're not full, you're not satisfied with your food, you should eat more. And when we start to undersleep, those two hormones go in opposite directions. We lose the signal that says you're full and you're satisfied with your meal, which is leptin, but we increase the hormone that says, no, you're actually hungry. Even though you've just eaten, you, you should eat more. And so as a consequence, people who are underslept can start to eat uh, somewhere between two to 400 extra calories per day when you look at some of these studies. Um, wow. It's not, by the way, just that you start to eat more. It's also that when you are underslept, your preference for different food groups actually shifts. And so you start to desire more heavy hitting carbohydrates and more simple processed sugary foods. Um, rather than those more healthy macro ingredients, which also sort of sets you on a path towards uh, a more what we call obesogenic profile. But it also actually changes how your brain operates in response to food. And we did a study uh, a couple of years ago where we um, gave people a good night of sleep or we um, kept them awake for a night. And then we placed them inside an MRI scanner and we showed them different types of food groups. Um, things that were very desirable, ice cream, chocolate, etc., cetera, um, or um, sort of healthy leafy greens. And what we found is that when people were not getting uh, the sleep that they needed, the sort of the deep hedonic centers of the brain were actually ramped up in response desire to desirable foods. And they started to want those more unhealthy foods. And this in part was because the, the frontal lobe in their brain, which almost acts like this 
um, sort of CEO of the brain, regulating and controlling our impulses and our, um, our emotions, that was actually switched off by a lack of sleep. And so now you start to reach for those um, unhealthy food choices. But I think we can think of that more positively and say, perhaps sleep can actually be a tool in your box that can enable you to um, manage your weight more efficiently and correctly. And so getting that extra sleep should lead to, and that's what we see in the data, um, a healthier profile of body weight. Yeah, I, I suspect speaking personally, there's no amount of sleep I could have that could make me lust after broccoli. But, uh, but it's, 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 it's interesting. Let's bring you into the sleep laboratory. And let's see. I'll, I'll order some broccoli and some electrolytes. <laughs> Actually, char grilled with a bit of olive oil and salt. It's it's not so bad. Um, <laughs> so, so someone listening to this, I mean, if you were trying to take a positive stance of this isolation time or whatever, thought, you know, I'm going to make this a time of learning and of creativity and so forth. I mean. That's a possibility for someone. What you're saying is don't forget, if you're going to do that, don't forget to make sleep a key part of that program. That's going to help on every account. That's right. And it is a time like no other where I think we have in some ways more sleep opportunity time. Um, and in fact, there was a, a recent report out, um, and it's not a scientific report, so we have to be careful not to overinterpret it. And they looked at 68,000 Americans and using sleep tracker data, sort of wearable tracker data. Um, and they looked at the change in sleep since March 13th, which was when the president um, uh, mandated uh, a national state of emergency. And what they demonstrated or suggested was that since then, there's actually been almost a 20% increase in sleep time um, on average as a nation here in the United States. Now, again, I think we have to be very careful. It could be that people are just sort of sitting in bed and you know, working or watching television in the evening. Um, but even if it's half that amount, I think what it may tell us is that this time, this very strange era that we're living in right now has unmasked what is otherwise a chronic persistent debt in our sleep. And finally, you know, when you remove the brakes on sleep, you can see that sleep flourishes in return. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's true of everyone. I think when we look at that data more closely, we'll probably see two clouds of data, one cloud of data where people are perhaps sleeping more, but then there will be this opposite cloud where people actually are sleeping significantly less because of the things that we've spoken about, anxiety about the virus itself, concerns, for example, about whether they all hold their jobs. And people, of course, tragically have lost their job. And so, um, I think we'll see shifts, but that seems to be an interesting trend. It's interesting. I was having a conversation with friends last night about how surprising the final health statistics coming out of this whole thing may look. Because if, if people, A, have more sleep, um, B, are being isolated, so they're not catching all the other diseases they might be getting. I think, I think flu stats are way down compared to um, a, a typical year at this point, partly because of the isolation. Um, less road deaths, less who knows what else. I mean, just possibly yeah. the, there'll be some compensation for the horrifying um, death rates that we're going to see from COVID. But um, it, it's, yeah, it's so interesting trying to put those pieces together. And here's, here's what is also interesting to me. Like one of the key symptoms of this virus is to make people incredibly tired, like a, a fever and incredibly tired. And I've um, like it's striking to me that in principle, we, we see those things as this, these awful things that happen. That those are the virus's weapons. Actually, the, the, in a way, they're not right. They're our body's weapons to try to beat the virus. We have a fever to try and burn it off. You, right. I, I, th I think that's medically correct. That's that's the body's natural response with a lot of pathogens. Right. And um, and with sleep, um, sh should we just view like if you if you're having symptoms and you're feeling really tired. Does it help at all to say this isn't the bug, this is me, and to listen to your body and to and to just and to get all the sleep you damn well can? Uh, I think it's a beautiful example, and it, it's another demonstration of that relationship that we spoke about. I think everyone knows that when you get sick or you get a common cold, what you really want to do is just curl up in bed and and sort of sleep, sleep it off, as it were. And in fact, we understand that relationship that when you become infected. There are a set of um, changes in immune factors that only go to work to try and fight these infections. 
but they actually will signal to sleep that sleep in, its, in, uh, in terms of its duration is needed in greater amounts. And in fact, there are immune factors that are sleep stimulating factors because the body knows that the best effort, sort of the most um, powerful healthcare system that it can call up in its weaponry defense against infection is this thing called sleep. And that's why we actually feel as though we want to sleep more. It's not just because we're at home and we're not at work and we have the chance to sleep more. It's that your immune system is actually co-opting and bringing sleep into the equation to help fight that infection because sleep is so powerful in that regard. So given all these reasons why we need more sleep now than ever, perhaps, um, talk to us about how how to get it. What are, your, what are your top tips on how someone can get a really great night's sleep? Yeah, I think beyond the typical what we call sleep hygiene factors, such as um, controlling your light in the evening, making a, your room a cool place, um, also being mindful of caffeine and alcohol, so I could give three tips for um, what to do if you've had a bad night of sleep, and then if you're still struggling with sleep, three tips for perhaps how to better manage that. Um, so firstly, if you're um, coming off a bad night of sleep, the first thing, and this may sound counterintuitive, particularly coming from someone like me, is not to sleep in the next day. Resist the urge to sleep in. Wake up at your normal time. And there are two specific um, reasons for that. Firstly, your body um, has a 24-hour clock and it expects regularity and it thrives best on regularity. And if you start to change your wake-up time, you will confuse that 24-hour clock. So try not to confuse it. Wake up at the same time, even after a bad night of sleep. The other reason is that if you sleep in late, you're probably not going to feel sleepy until later that following evening. So once again, you start to drift forward in time. The second piece of advice there relates to that. Don't necessarily go to bed any earlier than you would otherwise, because sometimes if you do that, even if you're feeling quite sleepy, um, you can then lie in bed and you can start to toss and turn. So try to push through until your standard bedtime that following evening. The final piece of advice after a bad night of sleep um, is resist the urge to nap during the day. Um, now, if you are a healthy, good sleeper and you can nap regularly, then naps are just fine. But if you are struggling with sleep and have had a bad night of sleep, try not to nap, especially late in the afternoon, because you can think of naps in that situation almost like snacking before a main meal. If you have a snack, you're not going to have the same appetite to try and sort of consume that main meal. And the same is true if you start to snack um, with a nap just before your main uh, sleep. So try to resist that. What to do if you are still struggling um, with sleep? I think the first thing is if you're in bed and you've been awake for let's say 20 or um, 30 minutes uh, perhaps, the advice is take a break. Um, stop trying to fight sleep because typically the harder that we um, try to force ourselves to sleep, the more stressed and anxious that we become and the further that we push sleep away from us. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit like trying to remember a name where you're um, sort of the harder you think, the, the less likely it is that you are to recall that name. So try to step away from that. Um, again, I think the advice here would be uh, you would never sit at the dinner table waiting to get hungry. So why would you lie in bed waiting to get sleepy? And the answer is that you shouldn't um, just get out of bed. Go and do something different in dim light. Read a book, listen to a podcast, only return to bed when you're sleepy. And that way you'll relearn the association that your bed is the place of sleep. Um, yeah, listen, to a few, listen to a few Sorry. TED Talks. That'll put you to sleep. Yeah, my voice, I think, and, and my inane words are usually the best sort of soporific known, known to, uh, to women and men. Um, I think the last two pieces of advice um, beyond, and that really is a powerful one, is, is just um, please stop, give yourself a break and stop trying. That can be really helpful because you know, otherwise, if you're in bed, you're stressed and ruminated, you're teaching your brain that this thing called the bed is the place where you're aware. Instead, you retrain it to 
when you return, um, understand that the bed is the place where you always sleep and you have confidence in sleeping. The last two pieces of advice, um, have a wind down routine. I think many of us have this idea that sleep perhaps should be like a light switch, that we get into bed and we can just go from a one to a zero, that it's a binary, that we can just switch off and instantly fall asleep. Sleep typically is not like that. Sleep is much more like trying to land a plane, that you've got to gradually give it time to descend down onto that terra firma of good sleep. Um, and the faster that you're going, uh, in terms of the mind, the longer that you need to give um, the mind to sort of gradually come back down into sleep. Do to one, um, meditation is useful. Also taking a hot bath or a shower, having some kind of ritual. And that's useful, by the way, not just because a hot, um, a hot bath will relax you, but we also have this um, science in sleep called the warm bath effect, where as you come out of the bath, um, all of the blood has come to the surface of your skin. And when you get out, you radiate all of the heat out of your body. So your core body temperature actually drops. And that's actually good for sleep. It helps you fall asleep faster and stay asleep and more deeply. Uh, the last quick point I would make if you are struggling with sleep, and it's a simple tip, but it can be effective. Remove all clock faces from the bedroom. Um, it's fine to have an alarm clock, but try to take away any um, information about time, because if you're struggling with sleep, um, knowing that it's 2.15 a.m. or 4 a.m., it's not going to help you. So remove those from the bedroom. Um, the last thing I would note, by the way, is that if these things are not working uh, well for you, um, this is a tip from a wonderful sleep clinician called Michael Grandner. Um, if I'm an, uh, an athletic coach trying to give you uh, tips for improvement, but you have a sprained ankle, then nothing I can tell you um, is going to be useful until you fix that, that sprained ankle. And what I mean here is that if these things aren't working for you, it could be that you have an underlying sleep disorder. And if that's the case, um, these tips really aren't going to be effective until you um, go and um, connect with the doctor and see if you have an underlying sleep disorder that has been undiagnosed. Whitney. So there are a lot of people uh, chiming in with questions all over the world. And it's like um, there are a number of our viewers who are really appreciating what you're saying and are struggling with sleep themselves. And, and one of the questions we've seen is around um, stress as it relates to our sleep cycles and our dreams also. Just what impact can stress have on the kinds of dreams we have and, and, and our, our sleep cycles in general? So stress um, within the body causes a number of different changes. One of the things that stress will do is elevate a hormone called cortisol, which um, is often thought of as not just an activating hormone, but also a stress-related hormone. Um, and typically, as we try to fall asleep, cortisol should actually be decreasing beautifully, and it should fall to almost its lowest point right around the time when we're trying to fall asleep. And so if we're stressed, and if you, in fact, look at the disorder of insomnia, people start to decline in their cortisol like a healthy sleeper would do. But just around the bedroom period where you're starting to think about going to sleep, cortisol actually starts to spike back up again. And that can prevent people from falling asleep. It's what we call sleep onset insomnia. So cortisol is one of the ingredients um, that can impact our, our sleep and our sleep cycles. The other factor is um, the nervous system in the body. And in fact, we have two branches of your automatic nervous system. We have the fight or flight branch, and then we have the more calming, what we call the rest or digest branch of the nervous system. And when we become stressed and anxious, we shift over more into that sort of fight or flight situation of the nervous system. And we also know that that needs to dampen down in order to stay asleep. And I think some people have had that experience where sort of mentally or even in your eyes, you feel tired and you know that you're tired, but there's just something about, you know, your heart rate and just the bodily stress, despite the mind being tired, that is preventing your body from falling asleep. How do we think about um, changing those? Well, as I mentioned, you know, the hot bath effect can help. Meditation, though, has also been proven to be um, very useful. Meditation actually tries to shift you over into that more quiescent state of the nervous system. And in people with insomnia, um, mindfulness meditation techniques have proven useful. It reduces the time it takes them 
to actually fall asleep. So those are some of the ways that we can think about both how stress impacts our sleep and perhaps how we can try to combat it. And, and to the point about dreams, do, do you find that stress also has an impact on the types of dreams that we have? It does seem to have a relationship, and perhaps the best demonstration of this is um, an extreme form of that, which is a condition called PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, where people have um, incredibly um, difficult traumatic experiences and stress. And what we commonly see there is a consequence of repetitive nightmares. Um, in fact, it forms part of the diagnostic criteria for you to receive a diagnosis of PTSD. So there is certainly something about our emotional waking life that sort of bleeds over. It's almost the red thread narrative um, that transitions into our sleeping life and specifically our dreaming life. Um, we do know, however, um, a study published um, some years ago now demonstrating that if people are dreaming and particularly dreaming about some of those difficult traumatic experiences, it can actually be beneficial that it leads to clinical resolution of things such as depression um, and trauma and bereavement. So there is a relationship between our waking life and our dreaming life when it comes to emotional health. And we do think that sleep and particularly dream sleep plays a form of, um, of sort of mental health in that regard and sort of dissipating and removing some of that emotional stress. Well, that definitely explains some of the unusual dreams I've been having and I imagine it'll be helpful for some of our viewers who have also been having odd dreams. So um, I'll be back later with other, other questions. Sounds good. Talk a bit, Matt, about just uh, the role of greens uh, on sleep. And like so many people, the news is so interesting right now. Your instinct is to take your phone or whatever to, to, to your bedside, you know, check it, check out the news last thing at night, whatever. Is there evidence about this, about uh, whether that's advisable or not? So I think there is a, a feeling in the sleep science community, of course, that the invasion of technology into the bedroom hasn't necessarily been a good thing. Now, technology has done wonderful things for us. Um, is the enhancement and improvement of our sleep one of them? I think at this stage, it's probably not. Um, I think in the future, it actually will be. But you, you mentioned the sort of the use of, uh, of screens uh, and phones in perhaps the hour before bed or even once we get into bed. I don't think that's advisable. Firstly, there is a concern about the blue light that comes from some of these devices. And that blue light will typically um, stamp the brakes on the release of a hormone that we call melatonin. And melatonin is a hormone that signals to your brain and your body that it's nighttime, that it's darkness. And we need that signal of darkness to um, enable the healthy timing of our sleep. And in some ways, we are a dark deprived society in this modern era. But if you look at the evidence, there is some evidence that those screens can actually um, change our sleep patterns. But more recently, I think that that's being debated. What I do think perhaps is the greater impact of technology is less so the blue light coming from these devices, but more so the, the, um, the activation, the physiological activation that these devices trigger. And we know firstly that um, if you're using your phone, it can cause something called sleep procrastination. Uh, it, it's actually a thing where you get into bed, you are tired, you're sleepy, you could easily fall asleep, but you think, well, I'll just, um, I'll just check Facebook one last time, or I'll just send that quick tweet and, um, I'll just sort of go online and order a few of those uh, things that I need. And then you look up and it's 30 minutes later and now you're deficient by half an hour in terms of your sleep. The other thing that these devices can do though is on the back end of sleep. If we bring those devices into the bedroom, a lot of us, um, I think the first thing that we do when we wake up in the morning is we swipe right. And then all of a sudden, this sort of tsunami of anxiety comes flooding in. And that trains our brain to essentially expect that sort of stress every single morning. It's what we call anticipatory anxiety. And I think a, a good example of this would be if you have to wake up for an early morning flight and you know that it's critical, let's say you have a job interview, there's just something about your sleep not as it's not restrictive. 
And having your phone next to your bed is a sort of a, a diet version of that, a sort of a, a LITE version of that, but it's still present and it still affects sleep. So if you can, a good piece of advice is try not to check your phone for, let's say, just the first five minutes of the day. See if you can just sort of hold off and you can push that distance of anxiety a little bit further so you don't train your brain to think, okay, every night when I go to bed, the first thing I'm going to be doing is receiving anxiety in the morning. You mentioned melatonin. Uh, some people swear by it as a natural uh, sleep remedy. Do you recommend its use for some people, for anyone? Well, melatonin isn't actually a sleep um, inducing chemical, at least so far looking at the data. It's a, a sleep timing hormone. So it helps us regulate um, when the brain is told to go to sleep. So think of melatonin if you were to consider, let's say, the 100 meter race at the Olympics, melatonin is the starting official that sort of begins the gun that starts the great sleep race. But that starting official with the sort of the starting pistol, they don't participate in the sleep race itself. That's a different set of chemicals. Um, so if you're transitioning between different time zones, that's certainly when melatonin can be useful to help sort of give your signal um, sorry, give the brain the signal back of when it should be night and day. Um, for most people, though, uh, melatonin isn't necessarily efficacious for improving their sleep. As we get older, um, the, the amount of melatonin that we start to release does actually decrease in total across the night. And that's where I think some of the evidence is actually um, interesting. It does seem to provide a benefit. The one thing I would note is, at least here in America, um, one has to be a little bit careful because melatonin is not regulated by the FDA. Um, and because it's over the counter, there was a study that looked at um, different brand, different sort of vendors of melatonin. They found is that relative to what it said on the bottle, there was somewhere between 80% less um, or almost 460% more a melatonin relative to what was suggested. So I think one needs to be a little bit careful for that. Um, what would be the dose? Well, it's usually a lot less than most people think. Um, some people will take five milligrams or 10 milligrams thinking that more is better, which is a very natural thing to do with, um, with supplements. That's not really the case with melatonin. Studies have shown that really the, the effect, um, if there is one, is best at something like 0.5 milligrams or even less than that. So okay. that and is that, is that, Matt, is that just to, to, for when you're changing time zones or is that, do you think that's a possibly effective for someone to take regularly? Well, um, I think if you are perhaps someone who is a night owl, so what we have um, are what we call chronotypes. So are you an evening type? Are you a morning type? Are you somewhere in between? And in some ways, that's actually quite genetically determined. So you don't really get a choice so much as to whether you're a morning type or an evening type. Now, in evening types um, who like to go to bed late and wake up late, their melatonin rise doesn't normally start to begin until, let's say, 10, 11, even midnight. So for those individuals who are trying to drag themselves back if they have to you know, go to work early in the morning and that they need to get to bed earlier than they would otherwise, one can try to see if melatonin is beneficial. But if you're young and you're healthy, um, melatonin doesn't necessarily seem to be very effective in terms of helping your sleep. What about any other sort of, quote, natural sleep aids uh, from, I don't know, chamomile tea to alcohol? Any, any other suggestions? <laughs> So for chamomile tea, we don't have any good evidence. People have looked at this um, and it doesn't seem to necessarily um, benefit. There may be some um, ingredients in chamomile that, that could have a benefit, but right now, no really good strong evidence that at least I've seen. You mentioned alcohol, um, and I'm glad you did because alcohol is perhaps um, the most used um, sleep aid um, rather than relative to at least um, prescription sleep aids. And it's very natural that people have a nightcap and they'll say it really helps me um, fall asleep faster. Unfortunately, alcohol is the enemy of sleep. 
and alcohol will hurt your sleep in at least um, three different ways. Firstly, alcohol is a class of drugs that we call the sedatives, and sedation is not sleep. But when we have a drink in the evening or a couple of drinks, we mistake the former for the latter. And alcohol will actually simply just numb the cortex, so you're just sedating yourself. And if I were to look at the electrical signature of your sleep, um, when you've had a normal healthy night of sleep, I compare it to when you've had alcohol, it's not the same. It's a different electrical profile. Um, the other two um, dangers regarding alcohol and sleep is that firstly, even if you think you fall asleep faster, you typically will wake up many more times throughout the night, what we call sleep fragmentation. So you wake up the next day and you don't feel as restored by your sleep because your duration of sleep, the quantity of sleep that you've had may be quite similar, but the quality of that sleep in terms of its continuity is actually significantly worse. Um, the final thing about alcohol is that it's actually very good at blocking your dream sleep, what we call your rapid eye movement sleep. And we know that REM sleep is important for a number of different functions, including mental health and um, your emotional stability. So that's really why people, if they are struggling with sleep, um, they should re err away from trying to use alcohol. It's not a sleep aid at all. It's actually going to harm your sleep. And would you make the same uh, comments about sleeping pills? Uh, is that sedation not real sleep inducing? Um, it is. Um, that is the case. The the um, sleeping pills typically that are prescribed right now are a class of drugs that, in fact, we call the sedative hypnotics. Once again, their action is um, they act on the same receptor in the brain that alcohol does. Now, the way that they sort of stimulate and tickle that receptor, as it were, is a little bit different. But in general, that's what they're doing, too. They're trying to sort of um, downscale the activity in your cortex, sort of knock out your cortex, as it were. And once again, you look at the electrical profile is not the same as normal naturalistic sleep. Um, so that's the same. Know that there is... Sorry. No, no, sorry. Please go on. No, I was just going to say that, that you mentioned prescription drugs, and that's the same for over-the-counter sleep aids, that um, even if they, they do get you to sleep, you, you, they're just not. I mean, do they, is there any, any value to them at all? Or should you just shun them that they're just an illusion that, that they're giving you Sleep. You're not, they're not actually giving you the benefit, the true benefits of sleep. Yeah, I think that that seems to be the case. And it's the reason that um, back in 2015 or 16, the American College of Physicians um, made really quite a landmark recommendation. They suggested that um, based on the evidence looking at the magnitude of the benefit that these sleeping pills have relative to placebo and some of the concerns, the health and safety concerns regarding these sleeping pills, that they must no longer be the first line treatment recommendation for people with insomnia. Instead, the suggestion was um, a treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia or CBTI. And it is this remarkable behavioral um, therapy and cognitive therapy that's been developed over the past 10 or 15 years. And it seems to be, if you put it sort of head to head with sleeping pills, um, almost like a Coke Pepsi challenge, um, it is just as effective as sleeping pills in the short term. But what's beneficial is that when you stop working with that therapist, and it can take somewhere between six to eight weeks to course correct and retrain the brain to good sleep, it's very effective. Um, you continue on with those benefits um, up to a year, recent studies up to five years. Whereas when you are taking sleeping pills and you stop, not only do you typically go back to the bad sleep that you are having, sometimes for some patients, you can have what's called rebound insomnia, which is where your sleep can be even worse. So right now, if people are struggling with sleep, they should really seek out um, this treatment called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. That's the first line recommended treatment that we have for sleep difficulties related to insomnia. Whitney, coming to you in just a sec, but just to follow up on this, I mean, I feel like there are still just occasional circumstances where those over-the-counter pills may be useful. I mean, I, you know, when I'm hosting a TED conference, my mind when I go to bed is so buzzy. It's like there's no chance I will sleep at all for hours. And um, I've certainly, felt, like anecdotally, I found it essential for a couple of those nights to take an over-the-counter drug and at least, at least get some sleep. You wake up, at least on the day, feeling 
refresh, whereas when I haven't done that, I've woken up feeling like I just mm -hmm. cannot cope. Is, 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 are there any circumstances where you, you, sort of one-off use is appropriate? Um, certainly right now, people in terms of prescription sleep medications, um, there is still a time and a place for those. But even there, it's really recommended for a short-term period, um, nothing more than um, a handful of weeks uh, at best. And then we should look to alternative treatments. But certainly I do sort of sympathize and, uh, and have empathy with that. You know, I've experienced that myself. And um, particularly with things like jet lag, I certainly will use melatonin. Um, to see if, if if it can help, and you know, if things like chamomile or melatonin um, do make you feel better, then what I would say is that perhaps the placebo effect is one of the most reliable effects in all of pharmacology. Um, so if you do feel as though it's working, then perhaps um, keep on with that, as, at least with the caveats that we've spoken about regarding um, non-regulated over-the-counter supplements. No more than half a milligram sounds like. Whitney, that's right. There's some questions online about technology and the impact that can have on your sleep, um, specifically seeing a couple of questions about artificial light and how that might disrupt our sleep cycles, and then how we can use technology to benefit our sleep, like apps and that sort of thing. Yeah, so we, we discussed a little bit about this sort of effect of blue light, um, and there was a study done um, at Harvard Medical School a couple of years ago, and what they found was that people who were using an iPad for one hour before bed relative to someone who was just reading a book in standard light, um, firstly, the use of that iPad um, delayed the release of melatonin, that darkness signaling hormone, um, by two to three hours. It al also decreased the amount of melatonin by about 50%, 50 5-0. Um, it also seemed to disrupt the amount of rapid eye movement sleep that those people were getting. And what was also interesting in that study is that when they stopped using the iPad before bed, there was almost a blast radius effect where the sleep was still disrupted for a couple of nights after. It took sort of a while to almost wash out the effects um, of that iPad use. But as I said, there's been some more recent um, reports that seem to suggest that perhaps those um, devices in terms of the blue light may not necessarily be as powerful or impacting. I think it's more about the psychological, the cognitive activating um, impact that those devices have and perhaps less so um, those um, the, the amount of blue light. And by the way, I should note that um, it is particularly um, light in the blue part of the visible spectrum. So if you are going to have light in the evening, and the advice is, by the way, in the last hour before bed, not just about technology and screens, try to dim down half the lights in your house, um, and you'll be surprised at how sleepy that can make you feel. So I think that's one of um, certainly the, the pieces of advice. It's not just technology in terms of light. It's also just the light that we have, the pollution that we have in the home itself. Uh, I'll come back later with uh, last questions from the audience. Matt, how much okay. sleep? Oops, how much sleep should people actually have? Is there a prescribed hour number? So currently, um, the recommendation is for people to get somewhere between seven to nine hours of sleep, and and there certainly is a range. Um, it's not necessarily a one size fits all. Um, it's very similar to perhaps. You know, the standard recommendations for calories, I could say that, you know, it's uh, for the average adult, it's 2,000 or 2,500 calories a day. But depending on who you are, your physiology, what you've been doing that day, that will vary. But right now, for the average adult, the suggestion is somewhere between seven to nine hours. Um, I think the CDC suggests that there is a minimum of seven hours. Uh, in terms of a requirement. But again, it's going to be different for different people. There will always be those edge cases, the sort of the tail ends of the bell curve distribution, as it were. But that's a good, um, I think, range to shoot for. I mean, do you think there are outliers, you know, the Margaret Thatchers and my wife's of this world who only need five hours sleep? There are outliers. Um, and in fact, there's been some recent work looking at um, what we call these short sleepers. And there are specific genes. Um, there are a couple of genes, in fact, that have now been discovered that seem to um, uh, be related to just innate short sleep as people who sleep somewhere between five to six hours a night. And that really does seem to be all they need. And 
sort of play around with the circumstances. You can bring them into the laboratory. You can take away technology. You can take away light. You can take away all cues that could otherwise influence their sleep and really sort of strip away everything but their natural sleep expression. And still, even when you give them, you know, a 10, 12 hour period of time in bed as an extreme example, they still only sleep consistently somewhere between five to six hours a night. So we definitely know that there is um, a very small select proportion of the population that is a short sleeper. Of course, when I say that, many people say, well, oh, I, I think I'm, I'm probably one of those, but um, statistically, the likelihood is is perhaps quite low. If that's uh, if that's helpful. Well, I'm, I'm I'm certainly relieved a bit to hear at least that that's a possibility because I'm, I'm married to someone who who seems to never sleep anything like seven or eight hours and um, and seems to be full of energy on many days. But um, um, <laughs> and I've been worried about her since ever since I heard your TED yeah. talk. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm not trying to encourage you to sleep. Um, but th this is actually a paradox, Matt, in that some of your findings are so, you know, powerful on the, the, the potential risks to ask of not enough sleep. Uh, we haven't had time to talk about this yet, but you talk about risk of Alzheimer's, you know, r risk of many other things can go up, risk of heart disease and so forth. Um, th th so that people could literally lying awake, lie awake, worrying about what they just heard from Matt Walker. Like how, yeah. and you yourself have sometimes done that, right? You've, you've had these new, you know, discoveries and have woken up in the night and, and been worried about the fact that not only what you discovered, but I am awake now and this may be affecting me. Is, is, does that happen? Yeah, it does. You know, and uh, firstly, I'm no sort of cardboard cutout of sleep perfection. Um, I've struggled with bouts of insomnia um, during my life. Um, and I'm probably the worst of all individuals knowing what I know. You know, I'm sitting there, as you mentioned, and I'm wide awake and I'm thinking, well, you know, my dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is not shutting down. I'm not releasing, um, you know, this specific sleep chemical. Um, I know that, you know, Alzheimer's proteins in my brain may be building it. And at that point, you know, I almost become like the Woody Allen neurotic of the sleep world and I'm you know, dead in the water for the next two hours in terms of sleep. So, you know, I, I, I joke about that, but, you know, I've definitely had my um, bouts and relationships with insomnia before. So I am very, um, I'm very thoughtful about that and how you give a message of the importance of sleep, understanding that it could be triggering. And I think you know, some of the information that can be given in the talk or in the book could almost be taken as a, a sort of a sleep or else scenario. <laughs> um, and that was never my intent. Um, you know, I think when I was writing the book um, several years ago now, I think if you looked at the public, there was still this sense of sleep, you know, so what? The evidence was just um, so important that you know, I felt as though we were at a stage where we thought of sleep as an inconvenience. And all I really wanted to do was try to perhaps change some of that belief to say, sleep is not an inconvenience, sleep is actually an investment. Sleep is an investment in your physical health as well as your mental health. And so that was really sort of the goal I was trying to offer. Um, but I understand that it, it can be triggering. I think, you know, I struggle to, to wrestle with those tensions. I feel as though it's important that people like the World Health Organization or the CDC not be gun shy in terms of giving us the information um, regarding risks in terms of our physical and mental health. And so I do feel it's important that the science of sleep is, is given to the public. Um, but I also understand that it, it can be complicated and triggering for some people. So someone who hears this right now and wakes up tomorrow at 2.30 a.m. fretting about the fact that they're not getting enough sleep and what that may be doing to them. Give them some practical advice. What should you do if you wake up consumed with anxiety in the middle of the night? So there again, I think it's, it's really this case of firstly, um, trying not to worry about it too much, um, being kind and, and giving yourself the break from sleep, um, not sitting there tossing or lying there and tossing and turning. Um, just understand that tonight is not my night. Um, perhaps I can just step away from sleep. Let me get up. Um, let me not continue to reinforce to my brain 
that almost like a dentist chair. When I go to a dentist chair, I've typically learned that things don't usually go well there. And because it's a reinforcing uh, sort of self-fulfilling prophecy, don't let the same thing happen to your bed. And the way that you can prevent that is if you are struggling, if you are tossing, turning, the best advice is get out of bed, do something different, only return when you're sleepy. And that way, gradually, you'll feel better. You'll feel confident about your bedroom and the bed being this place of restful, confident sleep rather than this trigger for rumination, anxiety and wakefulness. Wonderful. Thank you. Whitney. There are so many questions out there, many of which we won't get to, but we should um, find a way to to get some of these great questions in front of you, Matt, so that you can um, answer them. But I think the the one that I just like to ask here um, is about physical exercise. We're seeing a lot of people just wondering how they can use exercise to help with their sleep. So the relationship there, I think, is um, is quite powerful. We know that physical activity. Um, during the day does seem to have an improvement effect on your sleep at night, particularly um, in terms of the quality of your sleep. There is some evidence that it can improve the quantity of your sleep, um, but physical performance and physical activity, um, or even just necessarily, uh, it doesn't have to be that you need to go out for a, a 10 mile run, even lower level physical activity beyond sort of 20 or 30 minutes seems to have a beneficial impact on subsequent sleep at night. By the way, the relationship is also present in the opposite direction. When you start to sleep well, your motivation to actually go out and exercise the next day uh, is increased. And also your ability to physically perform um, exercise is also improved at a number of different levels as well. So there is that relationship and it's actually bi-directional. Wonderful. And last question for me as well. Um, I mean, you started your TED talk with a, a spectacular claim that lack of sleep um, had a big impact on sexual performance, certainly for men. Um, does it go the other way? Is, is good sex also great for good sleep? So there is a little bit of evidence um, to suggest that um, physical intimacy with your partner in that regard um, can actually enhance your sleep. Um, some of that, I think, is just related to the relaxation that comes after following um, that physical intimacy, that it ramps down the fight or flight branch of the nervous system and you go gradually into this more re uh, sort of relaxation state of the nervous system. Um, some of the hormones that are released seem to be beneficial, things such as um, oxytocin. And we also know just uh, that people who are having physical intimacy with themselves, should we say, has been used as a technique um, for dealing with insomnia. So there is a little bit of evidence in that regard. Um, and certainly I think um, if it's um, satisfying for all, that's when we typically see a good benefit. Well, never let them tell you that TED conversations aren't practical. Um, <laughs> Matt, <laughs> Matt, it's been a delight to have you here. Thank you so much for this conversation. And um, we may we may have some other questions to put to you to post on our blog or something like that from from the many other people who had had questions. But uh, but really, thank you. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And I'd be delighted to um, try and offer any ongoing help that I can and respond to more questions. And thank you again for, for hosting me both here and on the TED stage uh, last year. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Whitney, do we have anything to say about uh, the rest of this week, which I guess would be so, tomorrow at this point? <laughs> that's right. We have one more one more day of interviews. Uh, tomorrow's interview is with um, Elizabeth Gil Gilbert, uh, the acclaimed author, and she's going to give us some tips on how we can um, really work through the feelings of um, being overwhelmed during this time, which I think is something that a lot of us experience at one point or another, perhaps in a, sort of an ongoing way, uh, depending on, on what your circumstance might be. And so I think that'll be really uh, a great help for us as we round out the week. You know, the very first episode of the TED interview was with Liz Gilbert. And um, I, I just, I found her to be astonishing, though I, like really astonishing. As she said in that interview, I'm not her demographic. Um, <laughs> most of her books are targeted at women or seem to have been. But, uh, but the way she describes the emotional landscape we all are facing, um, I, I just found it so, so profound. And so I, I actually cannot wait for the 
conversation with with Liz tomorrow. She's holed up by herself. I spoke with her a couple of days ago, and, but she's she's ready to come and share many thoughts on how to make use of this time, how to navigate it. But I think you're really in for a, a treat, and and do do share notice of of that conversation. Um, thank you everyone for listening. It uh, means a lot to us that you come and spend this time with us, build community with us, learn with us. Um, as we've said before, we'll say again, we're all in this together. Thank you, Matt and Whitney. Thank you all. Take care, everyone.